Different stories influence how people interact, learn, and thrive. In a way, it strikes up meaningful discussions between people. Now, stories come in various forms, some longer, some shorter. Nevertheless, these dialogues and conversations convey some of the author's most deepest emotions. In some way, it represents the writer's own self. Today, we're joined by Jeannie Shaberly, the author of Mom, Let's Talk, The Healing Power Through Writing and Poetry, a memoir showcasing her late son's amazing talent and her journey towards healing. This book contains the collected poems written by Robert Shaberly, Jeannie's son, who died a few years back. I'm Jeannie Shaberly. I'm a grandmother, mother, wife, and a very good friend. And I used to be a medical secretary in my young adulthood and worked in Washington where we saw a lot of dignitaries and we had, we really had a red carpet to work them out. So I grew up in Washington catering to the Watergate group. <laughs> and uh, now I'm grown with four grandchildren. I have four children of my own and they have grandchildren now. And uh, I kept journals on all four of my children because I wanted to create a book for each of them as they turn 40 and they're all in their 40s now. But I did Roberts early because he died at his age of 25 celebrating his 25th birthday. And my purpose for the book was to publish his poetry. Surrounded by her four growing kids, Jeannie noticed how different Robert was from his other siblings on one particular occasion. Robert learned, was introduced to poetry in, nine, in fourth grade when he was nine years old. And he was an avid reader and he loved adventure books, fantasy adventure books. And he uh, had read one about uh, the flight of the navigator or something. And I think something happened, his, uh, line between fantasy and reality became real when he was nine years old and I like to say when people ask me what happened to him when did this start he had a spaceship in the front yard that he wanted us to all go on a trip an adventure and we played along with it but then I realized he meant it it was real for him so I shook his shoulders and burst his bubble and told him there was no spaceship, that he needed to come back to reality. And that was tough, and that was the beginning of a very long 16 years of mental illness. But it wasn't diagnosed till he was 15. They only diagnosed him as anxiety disorders, because they wait until the brain gets more mature before they diagnose schizophrenia, which is what he had. Going back to the time before the diagnosis, how did you cope with it? And how about your other children? How did they understand or react to the situation? First of all, I started going to psychiatrists to learn about his disease, which they weren't willing to diagnose, but I knew he had schizophrenia because his reality and fantasy was a short line. And I learned to help him divert his attention to what he was seeing. And when he was nine years old, it was all about adventure and fantasy. But when he was in high school, it became demons and evil and good fighting in his mind. And uh, I had gone to the Southwest and picked up a bear rattle. And actually I have it right here. I don't mean to get in your face, but here's a bear rattle I bought him and gave it to him and told him to shake it at the demons when they came to visit him at night so it would divert his attention from the evil. And uh, it did. It worked for a while. But then he got older and things became more intense. Jeannie had done all she could to make sure Robert was comfortable. But it was also difficult for her other kids. Taking care of Robert took up a lot of time because we were seeing so many professionals. 
So I had to figure out how to balance that with the other three kids. And that was really very hard because he took up so much time, but I managed to do it. I think they felt a little shortchanged because we're always going somewhere with Robert. But uh, as they got older, they learned to support Robert. When they were in their teens, they all had a driver's license and a car, so they got around. But they helped take Robert around. He never had a license or a car because of the medicines were made him lethargic and he wasn't feeling safe behind the wheel. But they were very supportive for him and helped take him to the movies and the grocery store and to other friends' houses. And I was pleased with that because it helped give me a minute or two to myself, which I didn't get very often. I think I was living with, uh, my adrenaline glands were going all the time. Robert has shown interest in the creative side when he was younger. So how was he introduced into poetry? When did he start writing? And what were his first poems? Okay, well, he was in fourth grade when he was introduced to poetry. And he wrote four, four very sweet poems that were a different style that he was being taught. And he learned to love poetry at that time. So it evolved into more mature poetry as he got older and as his demons came to him at night and during the day. And you could see he was looking at something that we couldn't see. So uh, it turned out he would pick up a pencil and paper and write a poem about the moment he was in. And that really helped him divert his attention from the evil in the moment. I saw that was the healing power he had through his poetry. Whenever he felt unsure, Robert would start writing a poem to calm his nerves. For many years, this was his habit. You mentioned earlier, of course, that you were writing books uh, or you were journaling all journals. yes journals for all of your kids. And um, this one is already published. Uh, we're talking about uh, let's mom, let's talk the healing power of poetry and writing. How were you able to put together the book? When did this all happen? What inspired you to do it? And when when did it begin? When he died, he had left a lot of journals and he had a lot of loose papers. He wasn't very organized. But in that were lots of poetry, maybe 50 poems. And he was trying to publish his poetry before he died. But with all the psychotropic drugs he was on, he was lethargic and had a hard time finishing anything. So when he did die, I found the poetry over a three year period and transcribed his awful handwriting into the poems and decided I would try to publish his poetry. And that was the reason for the book, just to publish his poetry. So when I finished after three years of transcribing and finding poems, I went to the Columbia Foundation in Maryland and asked them what I should do. I wanted to publish his poems and they suggested I go to Howard County Poetry and Literary Society and through there, I met Linda Joy Burke, who was a, uh, she was a performing poet and poet laureate in Maryland before then. So she had me bring her 25 poems and she was impressed by the poetry and asked me to see if I could write stories to support them because his, a lot of his poetry is so intense. You can't just put it in an anthology of poems. You had to have stories to support it. And that's where I came in writing little vignettes about from the journals I kept on Robert. So uh, that's how the book began. Most of Robert's poems were about his life emotions and fears. 
it was an honest and vivid image of his personal struggles and how he copes with it. So we'll have the first poem and the story behind it. Okay, well, here's his book, Mom, Let's Talk. This is the one that's being republished right now. And I'm going to start with the Avatar Warrior. Uh, uh, Avatar is a Hindu deity that comes to guide you towards God for salvation. And there's avatars that are used in a lot of the role-playing games that he was into, Dungeons and Dragons and so on. The Avatar Warrior. A warrior traveling a path of light and darkness, encountering confusion and stress, dealing with it by using God's word and wisdom. Using the avatar to show God is one to follow, that his love and forgiveness alone are the healing powers that shall help us to heaven, helping to cleanse the sinning souls of foes who battle the innocence and loving seeking the pathway to heaven and the paradise of peace. Now in that poem, you see he's seeking God's help for to get him out of whatever he was talking about. And this is before the demons got really bad. But in this last stanza, it says, helping to cleanse the sinning souls of foe, foes who battle the innocent and loving and I thought that was an interesting way to put it, helping cleanse the sinning souls of foes. So he's helping the bad people look for good. And I thought that was an interesting stanza on that poem. During his grade school or high school days, did Robert experience bullying because of his situation? Well, yes, there was a lot of people bullied him because uh, he would fall asleep a lot and they would wonder how he got such good grades because he was always asleep. But he was in a vigilant sleep, so he was absorbing information and sleeping at the same time. And his mouth would be agape and they would make fun of him because he was less, he was lethargic. And uh, I had one of his social study teachers called me one day and said he had to put Robert in detention because people were teasing him and he fought back. And he said, to tell you the truth, Mrs. Shaberly, I was glad he finally fought back because they really bothered him a lot. So I thought that was very interesting. However, through his poetry writing, Robert became stronger. His writing process inspired him to be tougher, stopping himself from doing things he could that could trample his faith. He was always pleading for God's salvation, hoping that uh, he would help him with this. He called it a schizophrenic cross to bear, which I thought was uh, pretty wise. But yes, he was always looking for salvation in all of the poems. Some of the poems you can feel the sadness he had because he was so close to suicide. And it was on his mind all the time, but he would clarify that he could not commit suicide because he was a devout Catholic and very religious, and he thought he would go to hell if he committed suicide. But he clarified he did not want to wake up in the morning and live like this. I mean, he went off his drugs a couple of times because of the lethargy, and it just uh, rebounded into a more worse situation. So he stayed on his drugs after a couple of times of going off. And it was really hard. It's hard on all of us. Now that we've established how important these poems and writing process were for Robert, let's go to the second okay. poem. This next poem is called Black Abysmal. In a mind so filled with burden, yet so unfilled with thoughts of good, tossing and turning, thrashing and burning, Scream and shout, cuss and fuss. He prays so hard in a messy bedroom. He cowers in fear from the night's horrible doom. Wish for the end, to God his prayers send, doubting his confidence at living life, 
disheveled and not revealed. Bright light to his dark abysmal night, his dreams are of snow maidens, frost laden, cold bitter chill, refreshing yet still. Demons harbor his brains, infests, his imagination lets fantasy brew, bringing up images dark and new. Again, I find the end of this poem interesting because he's talking about his imagination and fantasy brew. Sometimes I think he went to sleep just to have an adventure. And later they just turned out to be very negative adventures. But he's, as you can see, again, he's asking for God's help in prayers. While well, most of his poems were about his anxiety, hope, and faith. He also wrote other pieces not related to his emotional turmoil and beliefs. Okay, well, this is in high school where he's uh, young and wants a companion like everybody else. It's called Romancing the Heart. The white knight and the virgin maiden of beauty waiting for the perfect love, the window serenade to bathe in bliss on your own cloud nine. The friction of flesh that brings the sacred fire, the passionate kiss of souls, the romantic words that caress the heart, the rose of affection to start the heart in its down the river of love, always striving higher above and beyond. I thought that was a cute poem. I mean, he's a young man who wants to have a girlfriend like everybody else. So did he eventually get a girlfriend for himself? No, he created one. He wrote a short story about Frosta, an ice maiden, and we all knew that Frosta was his girlfriend. He never got a real girlfriend. Now, talking about high school, did Robert go to prom? He did not go to prom because he didn't have a girl and he was too embarrassed to go by himself. I see. So he really never experienced... Uh... Going out so with he someone. didn't experience that. He had a lot of friends, boy friends, that played Dungeons and Dragons with him. And they were a really nice group of intelligent young men. And they would come to the house practically every weekend and spend the night playing Dungeons and Dragons all night. So he had that type of social interaction, game playing, role playing. And his friends? Did they understood his situation? They did. They understood him well. And I think they eventually, with Robert's own telling, knew that he had schizophrenia because Robert used to tease himself about schizophrenia to make it lighthearted so people wouldn't feel, feel bad about addressing him. So they stuck with him. But they did, they did know he was schizophrenic because Robert told them why he was the way he was. And they still were, remain very good friends. I see. So t before we go to the fourth poem, take us back to the time uh, you mentioned this in, in the podcast, in the audio podcast. Take us back to the time when uh, Robert died during that um, concert that you mentioned. How? Uh, hmm. Let's retell this story to the audience and Okay. Yeah. Well, he had gone to a rock concert at Nissan Pavilion um, to celebrate his 25th birthday. He was unable to convince his sister and brothers to go. They liked heavy metal, but they didn't like this particular band. It was called Poison. So he hired a driver to take him out there. And he was not feeling well before he left, but he went anyway. And we got a call at 1.20 in the morning. I was waiting up for Robert to call to tell me about his concert. And we got a call from Prince William County in Virginia telling us that Robert was dead. That was not a fun call. And they had to call us instead of Howard County because the Howard County lines were down. So the detective called and kept asking for Mark. And I said, just tell me, Mark's asleep. And I have a section in the book. It's called, Just Tell Me. 
but Rob, Mark wakes up anyway and he's pounding on his dresser and we're both having a hard time of it. So that was a very distressful night or morning and it just seemed to go on forever. I don't think I slept for 10 days after that because there was so much to do. Because one of our sons was in France in a jazz band touring with high school and we had to get him home and that took a lot of arranging and it just, I do not remember the first year after he died. I think I slept a lot because my daughter tells me she came a lot to wake me up and get me out of bed. So I thank her for that. Although sleeping was made it easier. I was just ignoring the fact that I lost my son. But then I came across all the poetry and started being busy. And then my family thought I was taking too much time with his poetry and leaving them shorthanded. But I had to do his poetry. I just had to do it. So when you were putting the book together, did your family support you? Most of the time. Most of the time they felt like they were being shortchanged of my company. But despite their apprehensions, Jeannie continued compiling the poems and writing stories about it. In a way, it became a healing process for her. Yes, it was. I didn't realize it at first, but after I wrote the book, I realized I had spent six years with the book. I had spent six years with uh, Linda Joy Burke, who helped me write the book, and she would ask me questions that would make me cry, shed a lot of tears. But it turned out to be a very cathartic, grieving process for me to write the book. Though now I'm happy that he's in a better place, but it took a while for me to get here. Let's go to the Ford poem and okay. share something about this particular piece. Okay, Robert liked to travel. He went to Egypt in the 10th grade. In the 11th grade, he was in a theater with the, that involved two high schools. And they went on a Twin City tour of London and Paris. He went out to Stonehenge Henge and wrote a poem called, I don't know if you can see this. No, I can't, I can't make my right or left right. It's called Rock, Rock, Rocking. And it's really, I, I sense his head banging needs in this little poem. It's called Rock, Rock, Rocking. Tunes that roar, the chaos gore, blood on the amps, one after the other, killing the vamps. Tunes that roar, coolness that will soar. Leather chains and spikes. Rainbow rocking, tick, tick, talking. Riding the wind of tunes that rock, rock, rock. And I can feel the, 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 uh, the mel not melody, but the pace of this poem is like a headbanger. It's tick, tick, talking, and he's talking about leather chains and spikes. It's totally heavy metal concert. <laughs> so it's describing his experience during the tour, during the concerts that he watched. Yes, and he had a great tour. Although he wrote other poems, most of his work were centered on his religious faith, agitation, and hopes. Okay, I'm going to read... Angel in my pocket, devil by my side. There is a place where my heart loneliness hides in an empty void. At night my soul cringes and my mind becomes paranoid. Dreams of chaos, arrows spin, sanctified my senses and soul in God's sacred. Reverence lies within. Hold me tight, Father, as I claw and curse the air. Help me to heft and carry this schizophrenic cross I must bear. Be jeweled in my heart with megalomaniac diadems, crowned king nothing, used for Satan's golden stuffing, blood that boils and turns and toils, a spirit frozen over by tyrannical depression. See me now, before pain I bow, endless turmoil, evil most foul. So tell us something more about this poem. When did he write this? 
Was it during the time when he was struggling the most and thinking about ending his life? Uh, I think it was really tough. It was towards the end. And I think it's, uh, you can tell he's got an angel in his pocket. He's always looking for salvation. But uh, it's, he's asking for God's salvation and trying really hard. But he sees the d in endless turmoil. I mean, he just can't seem to get away from the negative turmoil in his life. But he's still grasping for God. Even as Robert was struggling with his mental health condition, he continues to be a devoted Christian. And I think this resonates to a lot of our viewers. Although we have struggles, but not as difficult as what Robert has gone through, we persist in finding God, a heavenly being. I think a lot of us relate to that. So going back to the book, it was first published in 2007, and a lot of people read this wonderful memoir. What were the reactions or feedback of the readers? What were the common responses? Well, people that have read the book come to me. They were inspired to talk about what they know of mental illness, their friends or family. So it inspired them to talk, which is what I want them to do, because I think it helps dispel the stigma attached to mental illness. Talking is so important when you have any kind of mental illness. Jeannie, you started this project to make sure Robert's poetry got published. It was your primary goal. But over time, it became something more profound and larger for you. So what is the deeper meaning of this project for you? I think through writing the book, I discovered how passionate I was about mental illness and how I want to help dispel the stigma of mental illness. Because of so many people coming forward and sharing their stories to me is what I want, and it is a relatable story, So they, and it's a timeless, relatable story. So I think that that will do its job. Discussing mental health is very timely, especially with the COVID-19 pandemic and everything attached to it. Right now, a lot of people are stuck at home and their usual routines have been temporarily been halted. During this time, many people are unsure of their situation and feelings. So what is your message for these individuals? Well, I think don't go it alone. There's plenty of phone numbers out there to call for help or go seek mental help because it really, it's, I want to dispel that stigma, but going to a doctor is nothing to be ashamed of because they can guide you in the right direction. And maybe you only need a couple milligrams of some sort of drug to put you on the right track. But I think talking about it is helpful, whether you're talking with friends, family, or professionals. Talking about your mental health is very important, especially right now. So many people are getting depressed that never knew what depression was because we're all home alone. All right. Thank you for that, Jeannie. Before we end the talk, please share with us your favorite poem from the collection. Here it is. Mummykins. Donny mother she be. I know her loving spirit is with me. Hugs on the phone, loving seeds she has sown. Like a beautiful flower, her nature has much power. Love and Jesus are both with her. Hugging pet people power is what she's got. We get happy, cheer lots and lots, and chuckle too, ha hoo, ha hoo. Happy Mother's Day. Loves, love, hugging loves Robert. That's my favorite because I found it after I had done most of the poems and it was just a loose paper paper that showed up one day and it tickles the cockles of my heart knowing that he had done that for Mother's Day and it was Mother's Day when I found it. So it's very special to me. Wow, I love that. It's a wonderful Mother's Day present. So Jeannie, invite the viewers or listeners to read your book. Where can they grab a copy of the book, Mom, Let's Talk? Okay, well, everything's on Amazon, of course, and Borders, and it will, will eventually be in stores and libraries. And at the back of the book, I leave my email so that you can get in touch with me if you want to. And I love to hear what people have to say about the book. 
So get out there and buy it. And lastly, Jeannie, do you have anything else you want to share with our viewers? It can be about mental health or anything you'd like to say to everyone. I think the main thing is to talk about issues you have, whether you do it with a professional or a friend or a family. And I have discovered the healing power I got from writing this book and the healing power Robert had from writing his poetry. He didn't realize it was a healing power, but I realized it through writing this book. So write it down. Find something to do to divert your attention, even if it's just depression. It doesn't have to be schizophrenia. You need. I personally suffer from major clinical depression, take medicine that helps me, but I surround my people with people that laugh. So I try to control my environment so that I don't get depressed. And I don't. I'm well-managed. Despite encountering difficult times and challenging moments, Robert's faith was unwavering. He continued to be a strong person, a vibrant and hopeful individual. Through his poetry, he shares his experiences and feelings. On the other hand, Jeannie found solace and acceptance in putting the memoir together. In a way, this journey of healing was made possible because of their shared love for writing. At the end of the day, a human being needs the hand of another. And by being open about emotions, creating an understanding of situations, we can create better relationships. Thank you, Jeannie Shaberly, for creating and sharing this wonderful memoir to everyone here. Also, we express our heartfelt thanks to Robert for all poems he'd written before his death.